I'm Don Burgess. I'm here with uh, Premier David Burt. Welcome to our second time we've had a chance to talk, and thank you for joining us. No problem, Don. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay. Now, you had a bit of good news over the last uh, 10 days or so with uh, the first quarter figures. Revenue was up 2.2%. Spending was down. Um, some people would have to say that you're like a magician to be able to, to, to manage that trick. But how did the, how did the government was able to do that? Um, I think what's most important is that we are following a uh, budget that we had laid out um, in February. And the first quarter was the first quarter of our own budget. So last year, of course, the budget was a budget that we inherited. We were able to make some minor adjustments. But this year was our first uh, full budget. And in our first full budget, we had indicated that we were going to make investments um, in not only economic growth, but also in uh, areas such as education and health care uh, to, in, uh, to ensure that uh, those persons who are having challenges can be supported in the improvement of their lot in life. Um, and so we are on track, not only with our budget estimates that were on track, but I thought it was important, especially with some of the noise that was coming uh, from certain segments of the community, um, including the uh, opposition, uh, to lay out the facts. And the facts are that our revenues were up, our spending when compared to the spending for a year ago was down, our deficit had narrowed by 24%, visitor air arrivals in the, uh, during that period of April to June were up, and that's compared to last year where there was the period of the America's Cup. So it's important to note that air arrivals are up on uh, the America's Cup uh, period. And also in addition to that, and I think which is most important, is that there was a recording uh, from the Department of Social Insurance that there are 322 more people working inside of the Bermuda economy than there were uh, a year ago. And out of that, out of that uh, 322, 83% uh, of those persons are Bermudian. So I think that represents um, excellent progress. But it's important to note that one quarter does not a year make. And we have a lot of work to continue to do, but it was important for the government to actually set out where we are and to make sure that people were aware of the facts. Because a lot of times you hear things that are conjecture, but the only place that the facts can come from are the facts and figures from the government. You know, I would have been one of the people who would have said, would have been an amazing trick for you to get more people in here with the America's Cup and mm -hmm. spending during mm -hmm. that point in time. Mm -hmm. So how are you and, and the partners at the Bermuda Tourism Authority able to attract mm -hmm. more people here? Mm -hmm. Well, I can't speak mm -hmm. to the specifics mm -hmm. of what the Bermuda Tourism Authority is doing with the money of which they're getting from the government of Bermuda. But what I can state is that when we were in opposition um, and when we became the government, we said that we would put additional investment into tourism to ensure that we can better market Bermuda to tourists. And I think that we, you are seeing the results of that increased investment into tourism. So that was something that we committed to do when we're in opposition. We said that we did when we're in government. And I think that we're being able to see some of the results of that. Now, one of the interesting things is you were able to give us figures of more people employed. Mm -hmm. Usually we have to wait for the, uh, the employment survey to come out, which mm -hmm. is usually a year after the fact mm -hmm. sort of thing. Is there a reason why we can't get those figures on a more regular basis if, that, if you're going to, to get it for the social insurance figures? Um, it, it's, it's something that we've always complained about inside of government. And so for us, I'm trying to find out ways that we can get better and more actionable data. And this means an issue of joining up various government systems so they can talk to one another. This is a report that we, uh, used to, uh, that we have used. So I asked for this report. I went back and tried to get additional data out of this report. And the social insurance figures are a useful indicator of real-time employment inside the economy. Are they perfect figures? No. Are they as accurate as the employment survey figures? Not entirely, but they at least show a trend. And their trend of the people that are paying into social insurance uh, does mirror the trends of which we've seen over, over time. So I think it is a useful real-time indicator um, of that. And that's the reason why we felt that we would share those figures. So can, can I elicit a promise from you that mm -hmm. you maybe we'll get those figures every, every quarter mm -hmm. or every month? Is that possible? Oh, I think, it, I think it certainly is possible that we can report those figures. Once I've started reporting them, I'm sure that people will be asking for me to continue to report those figures. Yeah, I know we get uh, more detailed information from mm -hmm. the other mm -hmm. surveys that are, that are done, but mm -hmm. at least, you know, in other countries, they, get, they release the monthly figures on mm -hmm. how employment is, and I think mm -hmm. people would want to know how mm -hmm. the economy is going. Absolutely. The thing is, of course, those countries are much larger <laughs> than, our, <laughs> than, than Bermuda is. But we are working on making sure that we can have more better actionable data in a quicker fashion. Now another one of the uh, things that 
that you highlighted, but also a lot of people are surprised about is, you know, spending is down yet. You've given mm -hmm. a raise to civil servants. Mm -hmm. You've uh, hired some positions that were left fallow. Mm -hmm. um, so where were you able to make the cuts to, to make that happen? What this is really about, it's about the prudent management of uh, the government purse. Now the fact is that yes, you can, you can unfreeze a hiring freeze that is there, and a hiring freeze may make up for positions which are where departments are very, very understaffed, but at the same point in time, you have priorities, so you may not be spending in other areas. So we have a budget. Um, the budget was established that we're going to do the best to hold the line on spending, and during the first quarter of the year, we've been successful in doing that. Right. You, you talked about the number of people that were working from the social insurance figures. How mm -hmm. many of those were government hires? I cannot give you that exactly, but I'm happy to get back to you on those figures. Mm -hmm. They were the same figures were asked in Parliament in so okay. far as the difference between in the certain jobs. We have been able to break them down to that level, um, but I'm not entirely sure of the variance of the government payroll uh, year over year. Um, it is not that much, though, because um, though there are positions that have been unfrozen, uh, unfrozen government recruitment does take a while. <laughs> To, to kick in. So it does take a while to actually get people hired. And at the same point in time that you are hiring people, you also have to understand that people will also be leaving the public service or also retiring. Uh, also dealing with uh, the figures and things, today the mm -hmm. retail sales mm -hmm. index came out. Mm -hmm. It was down. It's the third month in a row mm -hmm. that sales have been down. Um, how do you you know, you've got more people working, yet mm -hmm. people are spending less, either, you know, even combined with overseas spending. Mm -hmm. um, I, the retail sales numbers, I would say that are, are notes, um, but I think what is important, and I think that comes to another aspect which is critically important for us, as our economic recovery continues, we have to make sure that there are things that are fixed or mandatory costs in our economy that we get a handle on. And one of those particular issues are those of uh, mortgage rates. Mm -hmm. So it would not surprise me that retail spending is down when um, we are seeing that interest rates for mortgages have gone up significantly as interest rates, um, uh, as our interest rates uh, largely track what happens in the United States. The United States um, is uh, they reduce their um, they reduce their I would say they reduce their taxes they increase their spending which means that their economy is going to be turbocharged and the central bank will uh, will see those conditions and will raise interest rates to attempt to fight off inflation the challenge is that those increase in interest rates will then affect people here in Bermuda where our economy may not be in the exact same condition as the United States. So what that will mean is that there are people who are getting notes, and I hear this from my constituents, that are getting notes um, from their uh, banks that are saying your interest payments or your monthly mortgage payments are going to go up by this much and this much um, over the next few months. That is without question a challenge. And if we do not figure out a solution to that particular problem, we are going to not see the economic recovery of which we want to see. So the government is looking at how we can address that particular issue. Um, it might require a creative solution, but I think that on the overall balance inside of the economy, if there are people who are paying less on their mortgage rates, that means that there is more money to spend inside the economy, more money to save, and more money to invest, which will lead to economic growth, as opposed to right now, those rents being extracted from the economy and basically going to the profit lines of the bank. You did mention the United States and how so we're sort of at at the whim of, you know, they raise the rents, our, our banks follow suit sort of thing. Um, same thing with Trump's tariffs. Mm -hmm. um, I've spoken to a couple of uh, importers mm -hmm. uh, over the last few weeks and they've already noticed that because the United States is having to pay more for imported goods for the steel and aluminum, mm -hmm. they've noticed that tin and mm -hmm and aluminum products that they're getting on the shelves have ticked up in price too and, and you're very concerned about you know keeping costs down for locals how can we do anything in this global economy when we're sort of at the whim of somebody a president who doesn't really care about anybody else in the u.s um it's it's a difficult challenge i mean i think that's the basis of where we are i mean our main trading partner is the united states so there are things that you can control and there are things you can't control uh, for that aspect those are things that we cannot necessarily control but where we can control is what we look at Bermuda. And we look at Bermuda in so far as the amount in which we pay for energy, the amount in which we pay for health care, and the amount in which we pay for housing. 
and to examine those issues and talk about the real pain points that can bring actual relief. That's why the Minister of Health spoke about how the government is going to embark on an ambitious plan for healthcare financing reform, which in our view will lower healthcare premiums across the board for everyone while, prov while providing better and almost near universal coverage. That is the reason why we're talking about tax reform. We want to make it meaningful so that more money can go into the pockets of those people who need it the most. That's the reason we talk about social insurance reform, which I think was very interesting that the opposition you know, decided to attack what our plans would be. What we are doing with our social insurance system in Bermuda is bringing it into line with every other system in the world where they pay on a percentage of the income of which they receive. Bermuda is the only company where the receptionist who makes $40,000 a year pays the exact same amount to the social insurance system as the CEO who makes $40,000 a month. It is unfair and we are going to fix the unfairness that is inside of the Bermuda economy. You mentioned social insurance. I noticed like most other countries, Western countries in the, in the world, mm -hmm. they have extended the retirement mm -hmm. age where people can collect their pensions, mainly because they're in the same situation as we are, mm -hmm. where pensions are underfunded. When can we see Bermuda oh, increasing the retirement age to 66, 67, 68, 70? I, I believe I may have spoken about that publicly uh, before. It's something that we will have to do. Um, it's recommendations that have come, um, and it's a question of how we're going to be implementing that. Uh, but what I would say is that implementation of pension reform will happen in this next parliamentary session. The Ministry of Finance um, has a lot of data. Uh, the Pension and Benefits Working Group has been working uh, back and forth. So the two things that we will see, in addition to the cost of living measures, which I mentioned, is that we will see the issue of pension reform, the issue of tax reform and also the issue of social insurance reform, which will mean a gradual increase um, of the retirement age, both in the public service and also for receipt of social insurance benefits. I know um, some countries have, d have done it where it's like uh, every month it goes up. Up by a month every, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. something like that, Absolutely. so that it's not painful. Yeah. Somebody, mm -hmm. it's, you're not, you're not going to be telling the people, oh, I'm sorry, you're almost 65, you mm -hmm. have to work yeah. until 67. And that's up. it. We will, it will be phased in. It will be mm -hmm. something that will be subject of consultation. But at the end of the day, um, the facts are that we have to make our pension fund sustainable. Mm -hmm. And there's only two ways to do that. Increase the amount of money that goes into the fund or decrease the amount of money that comes out of the fund. There are no other magic tricks with that. So it either needs to be one, the other, or a combination of both. And so what we will do on the social insurance side is that we will find a way to increase contributions, which will not impact the lowest earners. We will find a way to make sure that we can continue to pay benefits, but we're going to have to reduce the amount of benefits that are paid. And the way to do that is by gradually increasing the retirement age. And with that, we'll extend the life of the fund um, out from where it's projected now to run out of money in 2049 to something that will be a lot further. I know uh, we may not be every person who reaches 65, but a lot of people who are 65 would like to work longer anyway. Absolutely. And, uh, Many. <laughs> and I get I, that. I hear, I hear the requests every day. Uh, the other thing is, um, when the pension thing was, was set up, it was set up when people lived less of a lifetime. Yes. So, you know, you've got people who are living to be 87, or there was somebody I read today mm -hmm. who celebrated a 100th birthday. Absolutely. Not that you'd want to work till you're 100, but, mm -hmm. you know, they're on, the, they're on the pension, they're collecting pension for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are the issues of which we have to deal with in our economy. But I think that one of the best fixes to those particular issues is to make sure that we have economic growth that creates additional jobs in the economy so that there is plenty enough jobs to go around. And that's the reason why we believe it is critically important to focus on the issues of the affordability of housing and also the affordability when it comes to mortgages, the issues when it comes to health care, and also the issues when it comes to power and electricity costs. And I think that all three of those things, I gave a speech to to um, the Rotary Clubs on uh, Wednesday night. But I said, imagine if, as a collective, we spent 20% less on mortgages, healthcare, and electricity. The amounts of money that that would mean, that would be an average of $700 a month in each family's, uh, it, it, you know, the amount of money that they have to spend, it would make a huge difference to a large number of families that are here. So that's where we have to focus on. But we have to recognize that with everything that is a benefit to some, there are entrenched interests that will push back against that very strongly. 
And you have heard me say it before, as a fan of Star Trek, I like to quote the line from Star Trek, uh, which was, uh, you know, uh, Captain Spock, where he said, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. And in this case, the needs of the many, such as the Bermudian public, have to outweigh the needs of the profits of the banks. The needs of the many, when it comes to health insurance, has to outweigh the needs of the profits for the persons who are maybe shareholders in health insurance companies. And the needs of the many, when it comes to power, has to outweigh the needs of the shareholders when it comes to our power monopoly in Bermuda. These are the things that are important, and I would expect that the Bermudian people will support us as we look to tackle these very difficult issues to tackle. Because at the end, if overall there is more money to spend in the economy, if there is more economic activity in the economy, that means there will be more jobs and more growth, and that means that not only will the people be healthier, but it's my assumption as well that the banks and the insurance companies and the power companies will be more uh, benefiting because there will be more activity in the economy. So we cannot just say that, oh, we cannot have this short-term thing. The government has to take a look at what's best for the overall economy, the needs of the many. And so uh, that's what we are looking at doing in year two. Right. Uh, living wage is mm -hmm. one of the topics I like to talk about a lot. Um, the government's proposed roughly $12, $15, $18 over the next three years graduating it in. Not the uh, government. Well, a parliamentary part, committee has part, proposed. Part, part, the government part. will examine what has come from the parliamentary committee, mm -hmm. will go to consultation, and will set out the government's mm -hmm. direction. So um, how do you feel about you know, those, those set numbers or those suggested numbers mm -hmm. as, to, as to phase it in? Mm -hmm. I would like to tell you that I have uh, reviewed the report in detail. I mm -hmm. have not. Mm -hmm. um, I know there was a very good parliamentary debate. Uh, this issue will be led on from the government side mm -hmm. by the minister who is responsible for labor, so the minister of home affairs. That will be Minister uh, Walton Brown. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important when you talk about the living wage to recognize that living wage is based upon also how expensive things are in the economy. And if you talk about the things which I said before, whether it's the amount of money that people spend on housing or mortgages, the amount of money that people spend on health insurance, the amount of money that people spend on energy, if those things can be reduced, then the living wage or the needs to push up wages to meet the challenges are less. And so that's where our focus has to be. It has to be a two-pronged focus. Mm -hmm. Yes, we want to make sure that people have more money in their pockets, and that can be through tax reform and or the other things of which I've spoken about, but it's also to ensure that the costs are less inside of the economy so that the wages may not be, have to be as high. Because there is that argument that, of course, if people have to pay more, then they can afford to pay less, and it has those things. Everything in the economy is a push and pull. So from a government, where we're looking at everyone, we have to look at what's the way that we can have the, the, make the uh, change that affects the largest amount of people with the least amount of challenges that can come from that particular change. Because every change you make will affect one person or the other. Uh, one of my Facebook friends, there's a whole argument that was, uh, argument, discussion mm -hmm. that was, uh, on, it might have been on all, uh, all things politics Bermuda, mm -hmm. and they were talking about it, and the person said, well, by increasing the minimum wage, that's only going to help, the, at, at least at the beginning, uh, the expatriate workers mm -hmm. who will then send more money overseas. Mm -hmm. How would you respond to that? Um, I would say that that's not entirely accurate, and I think what's the most key and critical point about the entire discussion of the living wage, and it was a thing that we referred to in the Progressive Labor Party platform, it's very simple. People who are working full time, who are employed, gainfully employed, should not be working in poverty. And that's something that we have to do our best to challenge in this country. And I think through the measures of not only a living wage, but also the measures of cost containment on the other side, when it comes to housing, mortgages, health care, and energy, those will have the desired effects to have people be more comfortable here. Because there's other things that factor into it, and the factor is the cost of living. The fact is that we have to come to grips that there are people that are employed that leave Bermuda because of the cost being as high as they are. So it's not just economic refugees who cannot find work. It is also people who leave and flee the country who are working because they just want to have a better standard of living. The way you address that problem is through the types of reforms of which we've spoken about. And so, as I said, health insurance reform is something that I'm very excited about. I'm very excited about the plans that the Minister of Health has. They've laid out, they were laid out in a 2012 report that was done by the former Minister of Health. 
for five years under the One Bermuda Alliance. It sat on the shelf. We've now picked it up and we're going to put it through where everyone will be in a single health insurance pool. And that means that the cost for everyone will be spread across an entire pool and everyone's cost will be reduced. That is the nature of it, and that's where we're looking to get to. And I have every confidence that the Minister of Health, with the support of uh, the colleagues inside of healthcare and also Bermuda First, will push that through so we can get to a place where people are paying less for health insurance. I, just to totally switch gears here, the one of the things that's been uh, big in the last few days is talking about sexual predator registry, mm -hmm. uh, sexual offenders registry, um, MP. Uh, uh, De Silva mentioned chemical castration. Um, I think like we've, we're seeing a lot more cases before the courts because of the efforts of SCARS to, to get it out. So, you know, last week there, or the week before last, you had the gentleman for a 30 year ago rape. Um, you had the grandfather. Why, what's your position on a, a sexual registry? Um, I think the position on the registry will be the position that was spelled out inside of our platform. That is the reason why the government supported the formation of a parliamentary committee to continue the work that was in the last parliament to come up with recommendations. And I think if you look at the recommendations that came out of the committee's report, there was a recommendation for a tiered register with public notification when the community is in danger. And I think it's important to note that the Progressive Labor Party government is the first government ever to notify the community on the release of a dangerous sex offender. The PLP was the first government to do that. So we are in line with making sure that we can protect the people inside of our community, and we're going to make sure that we examine the report very carefully, and the government will come forward with what we are going to do. I think that the Attorney General on Wednesday made a statement in the Senate where she spoke about the stuff of which the government has already done and the next steps, responding and thanking the Parliamentary Committee for her work. And I think it'll be an excellent thing that Bernou sit down and talk with the Attorney General so you can find out in depth the thinking behind the government's policy response. But we will examine the report. Parliament has approved the report. We'll examine the report and the government will come back uh, with what we're going to do in order to implement. But I do not believe whatever is implemented would be that far from the recommendations that came from uh, the uh, parliamentary committee. Oh. Have you known anybody personally that's been sexually exploited or assaulted? No, I think absolutely. I think yeah. there are many people inside of the community that do know. And I think what's most important from that aspect is, as you said, oh. there are more and more people that are coming forward. And we have to make sure that create a culture inside of our country where, number one, it is not acceptable. Number two, we do not come and go through the business of covering these things up because covering up can lead to long-term trauma and other things later in life. So I think that I commend the work uh, that is being done by people like SCARS, and the government will continue to support those efforts and to make sure that we can reduce that type of activity inside of our community. It, it seems like uh, some people would say uh, the, cu the culture had been like, we don't talk about it because it's embarrassing to our family mm -hmm, or it's a mm -hmm, thing, mm -hmm. you know. How do you, you know, how do you get, start those sort of discussions to get people to, to It's very to simple. You talk about it. <laughs> That's the only way to do it. You have to talk about it and you have to recognize um, that you have to get past that issue of shame and recognize the fact that it is a crime that has long-term impacts on uh, young people's development. And that's the only way that you can advance that discussion, by continuing to have that conversation, continuing to encourage, and continuing to make sure that you set up systems in place, whether they be in the uh, government, whether they be in schools, whether they be in communities, to make sure to identify these issues where they may arise and make sure they can be adequately reported and investigated. I guess as an example, that earlier this year there was a gentleman who assaulted a schoolgirl on a on a bus, mm -hmm. and it was like the third time that he was convicted of doing the same sort of similar, you know, assaulting a schoolgirl on a bus over mm -hmm. the last five years. Mm -hmm. But like nobody had really tied all the pieces together mm -hmm. that you know this is a habitual problem. Mm -hmm. So now government is at least looking to. Um, ban him from being on the buses, mm -hmm. is this the sort of thing that people should be doing, letting, letting people, authority know? Because you know, sometimes you only have one part of the puzzle. Well, that's it. And I mean, think what you would see from uh, the part of, part of the fact of a register is to make sure that, they, that those things are there. Uh, so that that type of notification can be uh, shared. But I think that you've seen, as you've stated, from the action of the government and the complaints that have come in, we're taking steps on that particular case. But there is more work to be done 
but I have every confidence that the Attorney General is on the right track. She's very strong on this issue. She's been strong on this issue from the beginning. And I have every confidence that we'll be able to come to better grips with this issue inside of our community. The, what's happening with the Grand Atlantic? Earlier this year, you mentioned mm -hmm. that work would probably begin in April, mm -hmm. it's August. Mm -hmm. what, where are we at? Um, with the Grand Atlantic, I think there was something that was passed in Parliament. It went through the Senate. Mm -hmm. um, it went through the Senate yesterday, I think, Senate Wednesday, no, sorry, on Wednesday. It went through the Senate, and that is to enable the, Bermudian How the Bermuda Housing Corporation uh, to form a joint venture with the company that has, been, uh, has won the RFP for the second time uh, to go through and to uh, turn it into a condo hotel. I cannot give you the actual mm -hmm. update of the time it started. I don't okay. have that in my briefing notes. But it has started. But the minutes, well, that process um, has mm -hmm. commenced. So I know that there was one final holdup on the legal side. We managed to get that item through Parliament before Parliament rose to give the Bermuda Housing Corporation express permission to go ahead and set up a subsidiary to go ahead and advance that project. Um, and I do not have the actual information in front of me, unfortunately. The Minister of Public Works is on uh, vacation, but I'm happy to find out, and I'm sure that he will not have any issue talking with Burn News to find mm -hmm. out what exactly, and giving an update, or maybe even a tour of the site. Okay. How's that being funded? How's that being funded? It's a joint venture. It's not any funding from the government, okay. uh, per se. It's a funding, it's funding that is being coming from the, um, it's been coming from the developer and uh, particular sales. So that's the funding. Uh, there's a mix of bank funding as well. I don't want to speak too much on it because I'm not aware of the specifics, but I do know that this is a plan that the Bermuda Housing Corporation has to figure out a way um, that we can relieve some of the uh, burden that the project has on the government's balance sheet. Now, I know uh, after Shelley Bay, there was a decision to, to pull back on it. Um, with a number of signatures, uh, quite a significant number of signatures from people protesting what was going to happen. Um, some of the people who pro wrote in and complained about the ATVs down at the mm -hmm. West End said, you know, well, you listened to them, but you didn't listen to us. What's mm -hmm. the difference between the two? I don't think it's a question of listen to one and not listen to the other. I think at the aspect in the government, we have to balance all things um, which come uh, to our plate. On the issue of Shelley Bay, there were a number of things uh, that uh, came up and arose. And at the end of the day, I think that we're going to get ourselves to a mutually accepted solution. I think the difference between the two instances is one was being led by the government in the issue of the ATVs, and the other was being um, led um, seemingly on a public face from the Bermuda Tourism Authority. And I think that there were some issues and communications that were happening during that process, which may have uh, caused more angst than needed to have been caused. That much being said, we're going to re-examine, but I think at the end of the day, in the exact same way as it was uh, with the ATVs in the West, we support entrepreneurs. Um, I know some of the entrepreneurs that want to be down there, and we are going to make sure that we can find a way that the entrepreneurs can be there, that there can be the accessibility demands which came, and that we can continue to enhance our tourism product for both locals and for tourists. But I think it's important that you're reflective of the needs of the community. We did consult. Um, there was temperatures that needed to be raised unnecessarily. And so we're going to get to a place where we can get to a common ground where we can say everyone supports the way in which we're moving forward. And using the word support, our last question, always lighthearted. Um, last question, oh boy. Uh, who, do you, who are you supporting in the mm -hmm. Premier League? Um, I support West Ham United. Okay. I didn't know. I, 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 I promise I'll give your listeners, you can ask a couple more questions. Go ahead. Go ahead. Because I know you have a few more. Okay. I have to wrap up that quick. My next meeting is at 3.15 and we're oh. at 3.05. Okay, great. I'll give you another seven minutes. Okay. Well, uh, going back to Shelley Bay, mm -hmm. I know I had um, a couple of MPs talk to me. They weren't very um, happy with the reversal on the decision. Mm -hmm. And when you have a large majority mm -hmm. of 20, you know, 25, 11, how difficult is it as Premier to try to mm -hmm. keep everyone happy in the family? And here's the point which I want you to get. I like how you said the word reversal. And I think that's the key point here. It is difficult to reverse if their decision has not been made. Mm -hmm. The people who have responsibility for parks in this country are the Bermuda government. It is not the Bermuda Tourism Authority. So the Bermuda Tourism Authority may have had a vision, but at the end of the day, the people who make the decisions on what happened inside of public parks is the Bermuda government. So we are examining the various options of which were put forward, and we are going to come at a place which is going to be acceptable for all people inside of the community. But I think that it's important to realize I do not accept the term reversal 
because it has to be something that comes from the government in the first place. There was a vision that was put out by the Bermuda Tourism Authority. That vision was circulated. There were some challenges to that. There were some suggestions on changes that should occur. But during the point in time when those challenges or changes should occur, there were some things that were taking place which managed to inflame tensions. And what's most important is that people can talk to people with facts and in a calm and decent fashion. That's what broke down during that process. We are going to make sure that it happens in a proper and correct way so that next year we can have a situation where there is accessibility at the beach, where there are people that are doing things in a, in a manner which is befitting of that particular community, and that we can have a win-win for both sides. Well, it seemed like that was happening anyway, because of the original... It wasn't. Uh, if it was happening, Don, if it was happening, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. Well, because part of the thing was alcohol was part of the original plan mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. they, they had, and that was taken away. Mm -hmm. And then the containers were taken away, mm -hmm. and it was going to be up in the center. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like the concessions were being made to mm -hmm. listening to the public, but then mm -hmm. it, it just it changed that like people weren't happy with those changes. Then I wouldn't uh, see, but the, uh, you're reading too much into this, and so let okay. me try it one more time. The challenge which we had over that particular issue were that it was getting to the point where people were not talking to each other and listening and going and acting in a fashion. We are going to make sure that whatever happens on the beach has the support, fits inside the vision of the government, and works insofar as promoting entrepreneurs and keeping the unique nature of Shelley Bay. We will get it to a point where it works. What we cannot have is for there to be interactions from people who are paid from the public purse, which will, in some ways, in shape or form, be taken as disrespectful to the voting public who pay those salaries. The, well, the other part of my question there was, you've, you've got 25, well, 24 other people besides mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. In the House and, of Assembly, yes. absolutely. And um, you know, a lot of them are on the back bench. Mm -hmm. When you have such a large majority, how do you, how do you keep everything in the family and mm -hmm. try to keep everyone happy mm -hmm. um, when you, you were dealing with that many different kinds of diverse personalities? Well I, well, I don't, I mean, there are diverse personalities, but there's a very simple thing. We're all united that we are all elected under a platform which stated exactly what we're going to do. So as long as we follow our platform and as long as we push forward on the things which are stated on our platform, we're able to get most things done. On this particular instance on Shelley Bay, there were challenges that arose in the way that communication was happening from various bodies that caused a breakdown. And that breakdown has to be rectified. We will fix it. And as we've made it very clear, is that when it comes to what is going to happen at Shelly Bay going forward, it will be a decision of the government. And the government will be the one deciding the way forward on that particular matter. You haven't had to make any cabinet changes, mm -hmm. uh, except for when um, MP De Silva mm -hmm. stepped down. Um, how happy are you with your cabinet at this point? My cabinet is performing reasonably well. I think we've been able to uh, report um, increased job numbers in the economy, revenue being up, spending uh, being down, the deficit being narrowed, and um, an increase in tourism. In addition to that, we have businesses that are starting up, and we're doing uh, work inside the community. If you look at the uh, items which are taking place in education, the amount of students who've been able to go to school who weren't able to do that uh, before, the people coming out of the dual enrollment program, us making sure that more and more people are getting trained, the work that's taking place in fintech with the companies that are setting up, the fact that we now have, uh, that the governor has approved um, our new banking licenses and uh, uh, legislation so that we're going to be able uh, to have a new uh, banks inside of this country. I think it's an exciting time. So the cabinet's been very hard at work. If there's one lesson that I've learned this year is that you cannot push people too hard. <laughs> and you can't. and uh, the cabinet has been pushed incredibly hard. It was the longest session of parliament in recent memory. We came back early in September. We met September, October, November, December, January was the only month off. We went February, March, April, May, June, July, and August. Uh, that is unheard of uh, for sessions of parliament, but there was a lot of work that we had to get done. Both work that was to meet our agenda, but also work uh, that was to meet uh, to prepare the country uh, for the uh, financial action task force assessment that is going to be taking place next month. Uh, so the disappointment, I would say, is that there were some things that were not able to get done because there's only a limited amount of resources. There's only so many people in the attorney general's chambers that can draft legislation. And so some things have to fall by the wayside and get pushed back to make sure that we could get the items done um, for uh, the FATF assessment. But overall, I think we've done pretty well. 
Okay. My new last question. <laughs> the, Your new last question. My yes. new last question. Uh -huh. uh, what's happening with Arbitrate? I mean, they, they said they were going to set up their headquarters here. They said it, probably two weeks they'd be mm -hmm. have the purchase finished over at Victoria Place. Mm -hmm. um, Stein's still out in front. Um, mm -hmm. Caldwell Banker's not commenting on what, what's mm -hmm. happening over there. Mm -hmm. are, are they still planning on moving here? Are they still planning on setting up? I can't tell you that. You'd have to speak to Arbitrate. Okay. All right. The well, government speaks for the government. <laughs> Private companies can speak for themselves. Thank you for uh, joining us again today, Mr. Premier. Mm -hmm. uh, we appreciate your time as always. And thank you listeners for joining uh, Bernie's Facebook Live coverage. I'm Don Burgess. I hope you have a very beautiful weekend. <laughs>